In Washington state, a beautiful young woman is found savagely murdered. There was bruising on her face, and there was bruising around the neck where she'd been strangled. It's a horrific incident. I was heartbroken. I mean, I was genuinely heartbroken. A confusing trail of clues leads to the man they believe is guilty. He was the only person possible that could have murdered her. But without enough evidence to lay charges, the case goes cold. Can two determined cops now prevent the remorseless killer from walking free? I'll never give up on a case, and I'll hunt you down to the end. Just outside Seattle lies the town of Kirkland, a picturesque community on the shores of Lake Washington. It's home to 27-year-old Elena Busiakos. She was beautiful, very Greek. Her smile was really captivating. When she spoke with you, she would speak to you, not at you. You know, she would draw you in. She was just a very stunning girl, very sweet. She was as beautiful inside as she was on the outside. On New Year's Eve, 1998, Elena has just one wish for the year ahead. We all wrote down what our hopes and dreams for that year was going to be. And so she wrote down that she was ready to meet her soulmates. She was ready to meet somebody that would cherish her and love her. Elena has had lots of suitors. But since her divorce, her main man has been Anthony, her seven-year-old son. She glowed when she was with him. She, she was a good mom very good mom. Her life revolved around Anthony. She wanted somebody that treated him good, and she wanted a traditional family. Just weeks after making her wish, Elena connects with a handsome man at the gym. She just told me she met somebody, and she was in love. In love with a charismatic Sione Louis. I'd never seen her ever that completely enamored. He was very good with Anthony. That was very important to her. It wasn't just her as Sione, it was about her Sione and Anthony. A year into their relationship, Sione presents Elena with an engagement ring. You know, they'd been working towards getting engaged, so it wasn't a big surprise. In January of 2001, the couple moves to the nearby town of Woodenville to create their first home together. I liked him. I liked her together with him. They seemed very happy, and they did. They seemed really happy. But on Friday, February 2nd, just weeks before their wedding, the lives of Elena and Sione are changed forever. In the late afternoon, Elena meets up with her ex-husband in a downtown parking lot to drop off Anthony. They shared custody. She had him during the week, and then she would drop him off on the weekends. As night falls, Elena hurries home to pack for a weekend in California. That Saturday morning, she was going down to see her mom. But Elena's mother is sadly disappointed. Plane loads of travelers pass through the airport. Elena, however, is not among them. Sione contacts Elena's friends, but no one has seen her. It didn't seem like she had just got up and went missing or, you know, ran off. She wasn't that type of personality. On Monday, Elena fails to show up at work and doesn't pick up Anthony after school. She would never leave her son, ever. She would never not show up for work. She would never not call her mom if she wasn't going to get on the airplane. Certain something is wrong. Sione reaches out to the King County Sheriff's Department. She hasn't called me. She hasn't called her mom. And I've just been talking to her mom over and over, and then she's worried. I'm worried. Detective Sue Peters is alerted. Sione had reported he last saw her as they were getting ready for bed on Friday night. And the next morning, he was still asleep, and she left 
which he assumed was to go to the airport. Detectives move into high gear. Then they were researching with the airlines, and it turns out she had not boarded an aircraft to California. Police mount an all-out search in the Seattle area. We need to find her. Sioni actually took it upon himself to coordinate looking for Elena. We were passing out her flyers everywhere we could think about. Maybe somebody knows something, maybe somebody saw something that night. Sioni actually put together a group of friends, rugby players, and searched the area of I-5 all the way to the airport, trying to locate her or her car. But seven days later, there is still no sign of Elena. What awful fate has befallen Elena Busiakos? I think we all knew in our gut that something horrific had happened and that it was going to be a sad story. Seven days after 27-year-old Elena Busiakos goes missing, investigators are running out of leads. None of her close circle of friends had had any contact with her. Her car hadn't been located, so there's a possibility of foul play. Prosecutor Kristen Richardson is at home when she gets the late night phone call. They said something to the effect of, we have bad news, we found the woman who's been missing from Woodenville. Her vehicle had in fact been recovered a mile, mile and a half from her home. And it was parked at an athletic club. The vehicle was unoccupied. We wanted to get into the trunk immediately. They opened the trunk lid. Investigators are horrified to discover the lifeless body of Elena Busiakos. She almost was in a fetal position on one side. Her body was well preserved due to the coldness in Seattle. It was as if she was asleep. She was in perfect condition. But on closer examination, we could see markings around the neck already. The medical examiner's office advised detectives that she had been strangled. A young mother fiance and friend murdered. But why? Investigators hope the crime scene will provide some clues. There were some items in the vehicle that could appear that she was on her way to the airport, such as a suitcase. But the clothes she's wearing may tell a different story. Here, this beautiful girl was on her way to the airport. And from what I gathered, she dressed to the tins and she did not look like she was on her way to the airport. She had her tennis shoes on, her sweatshirt, her pants. And on the passenger front seat, there was a stack of clothing items. Maybe she was gonna stop somewhere and change, or even change at the airport. But Elena never made it that far. She could have stopped to get something at a store, and someone, I suppose, could have snatched her and killed her and put her in the car. Murdered in the course of a robbery, perhaps. The driver's door was unlocked. There were no keys in the ignition. I didn't find a purse in the vehicle. Her diamond ring was not on her finger. It was gone. Potential that someone robbed her and killed her and panicked and didn't know what to do with her body and put it in the car. Detectives head to Elena's home to break the horrifying news to Sioni. His family is by his side. His sister had flown in from Hawaii. He called his sister and said, I need you to come be here with me. I can't handle this alone. Grief struck, Sioni willingly accompanies police to the station to aid in their investigation. It's typical anyone close to Elena, especially the boyfriend living with her. How would you describe your relationship with Elena? We are highly in love. Their wedding planned for the following week on Valentine's Day. We're looking at going to Hawaii because my sister lives in Hawaii. Elena did not have a ring on when her body was recovered. And so Sioni was questioned about that. Did she leave her ring at home? Sioni is certain Elena was wearing it. Could the killer have stolen the ring? At the end of the long night, Sioni takes a routine polygraph to verify his statements. The results of that test were inconclusive. And the examiner believed, since he hadn't slept during that time period, that that's why the results were inconclusive. The next day, Sioni opens his home to the police so they can gather evidence. 
you know, it didn't appear there was a sign of a fight or a struggle. We looked for jewelry items, and her ring was never found during the search. What police do find are signs of Sione's desperate search for the woman he loves. We recovered documents such as the grid pattern that Sione had established to search areas of King County. Police turn their focus to another man in Elena's life, her ex-husband, a former gang member. The original detectives spoke with him at length. He'd had recent contact with her. Elena had dropped off their son on that Friday evening. Had the pair fought, perhaps over custody? And where was her ex later that night when Elena was killed? They polygraphed Elena's husband, her ex-husband. He was home with Elena's son during the nighttime. His new wife was able to alibi him for that night, so he was not a suspect. Meanwhile, at the morgue, the medical examiners carefully assess the state of Elena's body. When they get her, she's fully clothed. She was in her clothes, but they weren't exactly in order. Her socks were pulled up so that the heels were almost completely out of her shoe. It appeared almost as if someone had redressed her. But it is the damage to the body that is most distressing. There was bruising on her face. There was obviously bruising around the neck where she'd been strangled. There was bruising in the abdomen area suggesting the victim had been lying down and the killer on top of her. And it could have been from him propping himself up in order to get a better grip to strangle her to death. Had he left any clues to his identity behind? At the autopsy, they did swabs of her neck, hoping to find the DNA of the person who had put his hands around her neck to kill her. There are scrapings made for the contents underneath her fingernails. If she were to have scratched somebody, we may be able to pull up their DNA from the cells that she had trapped underneath her fingernails. Forensics expert Jody Sass carefully examines the samples. Unfortunately, in this particular case, there was no male DNA there. Sass does find evidence that someone had sex with Elena prior to her death, but she can't secure a full DNA profile. Sione Louis stated they hadn't had sexual relations for weeks. So had Elena's killer also been a sexual predator? The underpants that she had on had been pulled up and ripped. Her sweatshirt had underneath it a bra that was balled up and stuffed up under the front. It was not on her. Anytime someone's body is recovered in a vehicle and it looked like possibly she had been redressed, that we look at sex offenders in the area. But it is a look into Elena's suitcase that gives investigators their first piece of the puzzle. The items in the bag were things that no woman would ever bring on a trip with them. Elena Busiakos has been found dead on a cold February night in a Woodenville, Washington parking lot. It was pretty traumatic, I mean, for all of us, you know, and especially being found in the trunk of your car is hard to digest. I was heartbroken. I mean, I was genuinely heartbroken. The possibility that the killer's motive was robbery is looking less and less likely. Somebody that had robbed her, that had taken her credit cards and her money, probably would have used them. And there is still no sign of Elena's missing engagement ring. Someone would try to get rid of it in some fashion, likely try to pawn it would be a logical place to look, and there was nothing like that. So who had taken her life and why? Detective Peters can't help but return to images of the crime scene, convinced they're the key to the killer's identity. We looked inside her suitcase and there was a pair of running tennis shoes, which seemed odd to me because, you know, she is found wearing tennis shoes and she was only gonna be gone for a couple of days. Usually you pack smart and only bring one pair of tennis shoes. Elena also had two pairs of boots, two hair dryers, and too much luggage for a weekend away. The first thing that was found was her suitcase, which she had packed for the trip. It had been neatly packed, the items were folded, and then there was also a bag in her car where makeup items were thrown. So that seemed a little out of place for the type of girl Elena was. The items in the bag were things that no woman would ever bring on a trip with them. There was a big, tall bottle of Suave hand lotion when she had a perfumed lotion in her suitcase. That's what she meant to take with her. There was a hair gel bottle with no lid on it. Nobody would take these toiletry items. 
So who had packed Elena's luggage? The killer clearly had access to her belongings. Detectives look more closely at Elena's fiance, Sione Louis. We found out that the relationship wasn't what Sione Louis was presenting to us. He had said, you know, they were going to be married and they're in love and they have a great relationship. And in fact, Elena's people were telling us, no, she was ending the relationship. I said, are you still wearing the ring? And she said, well, yeah, I'm still wearing the ring, but I'm not planning the wedding. She was scared of marrying him because she couldn't trust him. With good reason. He was married when he met her, and she didn't know it. She had found, at some point, a wedding picture of Sione and his past wife, and they weren't divorced yet. She had no idea he was married. None. Zero zilch. That was the first sign of this wasn't maybe the most honest man on the world. The first sign, but not the last. Sione hit on other women while he and Elena were together. Even Elena's friends. During the dinner at the Christmas party, I was sitting next to him, and he put his hand on my lap. I was with my date, and he was with Elena. We had all gone out one night, and he grabs me, and he tries to kiss me. I was like, this is so completely awkward and weird. Jacqueline tells Elena what happened. She was so sad, obviously. But I think she wasn't that completely shocked. I think she was starting to figure out who, th who this person was. But only days before Elena's death, she made an even worse discovery. Sione was in a relationship during that time period with another lady. There were a lot of things that she didn't know about what he was doing, that he was sort of living a double life with regard to other women. She'd finally, the day before she had passed away, gotten together with the woman he was having an affair with. They had discussed you know, what type of person Sione was. This woman was going to call Sione on his cell phone. And when Sione answered and started speaking with her, Elena then got on the phone and said, basically, you know, you're lying to me. And basically, she busted him out. Elena told the woman she had come to a decision. Either he was going to be moving out or I'm going to be moving out. She realized that she couldn't do this any longer. We find out that she had closed out her account with Sione, which was a joint account, uh, on Friday, the day before she was to fly to California. But even if Elena had called off the wedding, would Sione have retaliated with murder? In their effort to find out, detectives call in the hounds. It was a shot in the dark, but what the heck. Investigators have learned that in the days prior to her murder, victim Elena Busiakos had made plans to leave her fiance, Sione Louie. She was a strong girl. She wasn't this timid person. She was done. And so she said, I'm done. I think he lost it. The mild-mannered boyfriend isn't who he seems to be. He would played rugby, and he was a really, really good rugby player. And he had almost killed a man on the field, like literally almost killed the guy. He had to go. I think he was in critical condition. And there's more. Well, we had heard that he had assaulted a prior individual in his life, female. And Sione had become increasingly controlling with Elena. He was obsessed with her. It was not a healthy love in any way, shape, or form. Sione was very possessive of his past women and Elena as well. And one of his patterns was to call Elena probably too much. When we would go out to lunch, in an hour lunch, he would call her 30 times. She'd have to turn off her phone. But after Elena failed to show up in California, Sione didn't call her cell phone even once. There was no calling to her. There was nothing. It was like complete silence after she left. And the latest lab results raise more suspicions. Sione Louis was interviewed by detectives, and he denied any sexual contact with Elena. And in fact, uh, the underpants that were recovered on Elena had Sione's DNA. So that was another red flag that he hadn't actually been truthful to us. The more detectives hone in on Sione, the more red flags pop up. 
For example, there was a rental car coupon on the refrigerator that Elena planned to use in California. If she had left, as she planned, she would have taken that coupon with her, but she didn't. Detectives looked at Sioni's computer, and there was a search on there, Woodenville murder, before he even reported her missing. There was a pair of pajamas that he pointed out to the police. They were leopard print. Her friend said, no, no, no. Elena would never wear those to bed. She wore sweats and a t-shirt. When you pick up the pajamas, they're creased. They've clearly never been worn, never been unfolded. The bottom of Elena's shoes, her tennis shoes, were quite clean. There's mud and muck that goes from between their door to where the car was parked. How did she get from her house to her car with her tennis shoes almost completely clean? I'm sure if she was telling him that night that the relationship is over, one of them is going to be moving out, that he just exploded and was violent with her. Did a frightened Sione then dress Elena and carry her dead body to the car? She had clearly been laid in the trunk. She wasn't tossed in. Her arms and legs were not out of position. Heartbreaking details that reveal Elena's attacker had once cared for her. Sione Louis fits that bill. Detectives came to the conclusion that he was the one and only suspect in her case. But prosecutor Kristen Richardson knows they have no irrefutable physical evidence of Sione's guilt. You have to build a mountain of evidence from a million little pieces that puts you over the top beyond a reasonable doubt. They need more to put Sione behind bars, and Richardson has an idea. This car is within a half a mile of the house. Had Sione driven Elena's car to the parking lot, then walked back home? And if so, would his scent trail still be there? I just thought, what the heck, I'm going to call my bloodhound friend, Richard. Richard Sherman, a dog handler with Seattle Search and Rescue. I received a call from Christian Richardson requesting my input on whether a bloodhound could run a trail on a crime scene that was somewhat old. Sherman is skeptical. It's been almost two weeks since the murder. When the scent gets over about three days old, particularly in urban areas, it uh, degrades and it becomes very difficult. And only the most spectacular of dogs can follow those kinds of trails. Is this dog one of them? The original case detective got an item of clothing from Elena's house, which belonged to Sioni. The team places a bag containing an article of Sioni's in the same spot where Elena's body was found. I allow the dog to just meander up to the scent article out of curiosity and they naturally take the scent, and then I give them a command of find. And as soon as the dog hit on that scent, she was off in a flash. Tail went up, the, the head went down, totally focused, nose to the pavement. For two hours, the dog follows the scent past shops to a condo complex and onto a main road. You have to be very patient, and you just follow the dog and trust him. We walked maybe a, an eighth of a mile, quarter of a mile at the most, up the road, and the dog stopped and immediately made a right turn up a blind driveway. There's no markings there. There's no indication of who lives there or even what the address is. But the hound is confident of her destination. As it turned out, she walks up in front of this memorial on the porch of the house. Sione's scent had led the dog all the way from the crime scene to Sione's own front door. There were other police officers standing around, just with some of their mouths open. They couldn't believe it. It was just amazing, really. So had Sione dumped Elena's body in the parking lot, then walked home? Or could he have innocently passed through on foot in the days following her murder? There must be no doubt in a jury's mind which one is true. Circumstantial evidence uh, cases are very scary in terms of whether we can win them or not. The danger is that he can never be tried again because of double jeopardy. So we get a one shot at it, and if he's not guilty, he's free forever. We're looking at the evidence again and uh, trying to see if there's any other items we can send to the lab. But in their search for something to strengthen their case, investigators find evidence that could tear it apart. That speck of blood was a problem. 
Police are on the trail, quite literally, of Sione Louie. A trained bloodhound has tracked his scent from the parking lot where Elena's body was dumped to the home she shared with Sione. It was clear that the grieving husband-to-be that he was playing wasn't quite true. But the prosecutor lacks sufficient evidence to lay charges, so Louis remains a free man. Then just three months after Elena's death, her friend Heidi gets a surprising call. They passed the phone call to me and said, it's Sione. He said, I have a pantsuit that belonged to Elena that she always wanted you to have if anything should ever happen to her. She's never given me clothes. We're not the same size even remotely. Heidi, who's 5'9", was immediately suspicious that 5'4", Elena, would give her a pantsuit as a dying wish. I called the cops. <laughs> I called Sue Peters, and she said, OK, this doesn't really add up, but let's, if you're willing, um, let's set up a meeting. Detective Peters also offers a word of advice. It would be smart if you don't leave the building at night by yourself. Felt really creepy, really, really creepy. But I'm thinking this guy is super guilty, and we need to figure out a way to catch him. So we set up a wire order. My office was bugged, basically. There was a hidden camera, and there was a little clock radio that had a little hidden camera. There was a lot of high-tech James Bond stuff going on in my office. We observed Sione Louie coming to her business. Hello. Hi, how are you? How are you? Not too bad. Good. Your emotions are going all over, like fireworks. He sat down in front of her at her desk and brought a pantsuit. He was hanging in a closet, and I didn't have any people out there like that for it. Detectives had given me a list of questions that they wanted asked. You know, where were you? How did you feel? You know, I was actually out of town, um, but I knew that they found the car. What happened there? They found the, the car a week later. They mm -hmm. found the car at the uh, wooden mill, I think. So they never left wooden mill. Sione shows no emotion when talking about Elena's murder. Oh, I know. He didn't say anything that a husband who lost his wife to murder should say. Within minutes, Sione's real intentions become clear. Really? Yeah. He was there to see if I was single. His plan was to ask her out. <laughs> and when she tells him she's already in a relationship. So was Danny. Yes, yeah, I remember yeah. back. Good, good guy, yep. Yeah. Well? He was like, okay, well, good to see you. And he was Bye -bye. done, gone. I felt like a, a thousand ants had crawled all over my body. It was, ugh. Though the encounter reveals Sione's callousness, it isn't proof that he's the killer. I'm reviewing records upon records upon records and trying to piece it together and decide with other people from my office, is this chargeable or not? Well, you just you want to make sure you have enough to go to court and win the case. And Detective Peters has just discovered something she hopes will help them do that. I found a small speck of blood on the gear shift boot. Is it Sione's blood? Could he have cut himself in the course of Elena's murder? I extracted it for DNA and got a male profile from that. Unfortunately for the prosecution, this unidentified blood is not Sione's. It's not Elena's. Easiest thing to argue for the defense attorney, it's the man who killed her. And until I felt like we had enough evidence to overcome that speck of blood, there was not gonna be a case filed. For the next five years, it seems like Sione Louie may well get away with murder. You watch Law and & Order and it's solved in an hour. And I mean, I knew it wasn't gonna be like that, but it was so frustrating. And you know that a murder suspect has been identified, and he's out living a normal life. And what if Sione Louie kills again? He had a violent streak. He definitely proven that he, he, he was violent. Though the case goes dormant, the investigators are determined not to let it go. I felt over the years like Elena was sort of with me looking at the evidence and just going, come on, 
come on, you're almost there. I felt that way. All your unsolved cases are with you, basically, until they're solved. I'll never give up on a case, and I'll hunt you down to the end. In 2006, Sue Peters reviews the case yet again, this time with her new partner, Detective Christina Bartlett. What stands out to me is, is going to be different for another detective. Bartlett pours through the files and photographs in search of anything that might have been overlooked. That's when she notices Elena's laces. She has running shoes on. The laces are tied off to one side. One was on the inside and one was on the outside, which isn't a normal way to tie your shoes. Clearly, she had been laying down when the shoes were tied. Had her shoes been tied by her killer? I had actually contacted Elena's family. We, I think, received about four or five photographs. The knot and the bow tie is centrally located on the tongue of the shoe. We decided to send her tennis shoes to the lab to be looked at for DNA. So I collected a sample from the shoelaces. I then extracted the swab sample I collected for DNA analysis. And what I got was a mixed sample of Elena and a trace male component. To be able to further identify who that particular individual might be, we needed a more sensitive technology for male DNA. They submit the sample for the specialized testing, knowing all too well it will take time. We live in a CSI world. You know, life is not like that. We can never get DNA in 45 minutes, solve a murder, have a conviction, and on to the next homicide. The investigators know that in the real world, those laces may be their last best chance to put Sioni behind bars. We know whoever killed her tied those laces. Detectives are heating up the five-year-old cold case of Elena Busiakos, slain, they believe, by her fiance, Sione Louie. He was the only person possible that could have murdered her. But proving that is proving tough. There's moments where you think this case is never going to be a solvable, fileable murder. While detectives wait for the final DNA results on Elena's shoelaces, they focus in on a phone call Sione made to his sister in Hawaii. For some reason, he found it necessary to call her at 1.15 in the morning on the night that Elena disappeared. The question, you know, begs to be answered. Why, why did you make that call? Were you in a panic? Did something bad happen? And Sione's explanation to that call was he was sleeping on the couch. It was a misdial. He must have rolled over and it dialed his sister. She too had been evasive about that late night call. She had been interviewed by Hawaii police. We needed to see her eyeball to eyeball. Bartlett and Richardson hop a plane to Hawaii. We catch her by surprise. I mean, we show up on the doorstep of her work to interview her totally unannounced. Her interview is in support of her brother. In spite of that, these little details keep coming out. Details like her reaction to the news that Elena was missing. She had asked her brother, are you involved in the death? What the heck kind of question is that for a sister to ask? Sione maintained he was innocent. Nonetheless, when his sister arrived in Seattle to lend him her support. She said she did her own investigation throughout the house. She walked throughout, looking for signs of a struggle or any sort of person being hurt. Though she found no evidence of foul play. It tells me that there is some suspicion that somehow her brother has something to do with their death. Back in Seattle, test results from Elena's shoelaces have finally arrived from the lab. Will they further implicate Sione Louie? The outside lab was able to narrow it down, and Sione was the major contributor to the DNA on the laces. The more time that passes, the stronger the case gets, because we keep adding little pieces of evidence from week to week or month to month. Ultimately, that's what this case is built on, is a mound of circumstantial evidence. But do they have enough to convict Louis? The detectives pay him what appears to be an innocent visit. 
I want to be able to clear you. I have been working this case for a little while, and I have a couple of suspects that I'm looking at. Does Sione ask anything about who did it, how it happened, where she was killed, why she was killed? He asks not one question about that. That was very telling. To their surprise, Louis agrees to come to the police station to talk. He thought he was smarter than us and that he was fooling everyone because time had gone on and nobody had been in contact with him. So I don't think he knew what we had up our sleeve. First, they locked down Sione's story. Every time he lies, you know, we just check it off. There's another lie, there's another lie. Then they launch into some pointed questions. You said that he never tied Elena's shoes. Is that correct? Elena's shoes? Yeah. You tie your girlfriend's tennis shoes? Yes or no? No. You never pick them up and move them? Nope, I never did that which for me is golden. Sue Peters hones in on the night of the murder. You know when someone causes someone's death and they put them in the trunk of a car? That person has to be redressed. My partner is a bulldog and, you know, ultimately we go after him and she, you know, she really goes after him. We know something happened between you two. We know that you caused her death that night. Your DNA is on her shoelaces when you redressed her that night. He was definitely nervous, and uh, his hands were shaking. You're basically telling me that I killed Elena. I'm asking you, because it looks like you did. We're confronting him with all of these facts that he's lying about. One of the comments he made was, we are highly in love. That's a, really a false statement. Yeah, we were highly in love. We had our issues, but we didn't, we didn't split up. She closed her account. She wasn't coming back. What do you say about that? I'm not quite sure what you're talking about. I'm not quite understanding what you're, what you're really saying. How about this? I'm saying that you killed her. How about that? I can honestly tell you that I had nothing to do with Lynn. There was nothing happened that night with us. There was no fighting. There was nothing going on. Some individuals, after speaking with them multiple times, you know they will probably never confess. Well, you always hope for a confession. It doesn't happen very often. But that won't stop them from finally making their move. Kristen was willing to no longer let this sit on the shelf. We needed to do it, and the time had come. We're going to roll the dice. On Friday, the 13th of April, 2007, outside Sione Louis's home. We had a group on surveillance. He drives up and we arrest him. To finally put cuffs on him and put him in the back of a patrol car and, you know, you're caught. That was a happy moment, definitely. The detectives question Sione's new wife. She's not wanting to talk. I let her take out quite a bit of aggression and get the questions in where I can. She is the type of woman that stuck behind her husband. Whatever he said or whatever he did, uh, he could not possibly have murdered Elena. That's when a crucial piece of evidence catches the eagle eye of Sue Peters. Right then, the bells and whistles are starting to go off in my head. It's almost like a smoking gun. After five long years, investigators have finally arrested Sione Louie for the murder of his fiance. We were 100% sure that we had the right person. There isn't anybody else that could have done this. But will their circumstantial case be enough to convict him? Then, during the investigator's interview with Sione's new wife... Sue, who has eagle eyes about everything that's potential evidence, happened to notice his new wife's diamond ring. I asked her, was she with Sione when he picked out your wedding ring? And she said, no, she wasn't. Celeste tells us, oh, I think he bought my ring from a pawn shop. And then right then, the bells and whistles are starting to go off in my head, and I'm going, oh my gosh, don't tell me he gave her Elena's ring. The ring missing from Elena's body and thought perhaps stolen by her ruthless killer. 
It was one of those pieces of the puzzle that was building the monster that Sione Louie really is. This guy has told us over and over again that he never saw Elena's ring, he never found it in the house, and now he has given it to his new wife. She agrees to let us photograph her ring. Armed with the photo, Detective Peters digs up an old piece of evidence. In Elena's glove box, there were miscellaneous documents, and I noted one was a receipt for some type of ring. It provides Peters with a detailed description of Elena's engagement ring, but is it the same make and model that Sioni's wife now wears? Sue Peters heads to the jewelry store to find out. I may have went over the speed limit a little bit. Peters waits with bated breath to see the ring. The ring at their store matched the ring in the photograph, which was Sioni's new wife's ring. So I remember sitting at my desk and Sue calling me giddy with euphoria, saying, it's the same ring, it's the same ring. It was very exciting. It was a good feeling to remove that ring from her finger. I felt like this was the last thing we really needed to get a conviction. A year later, the trial of Sione Louie gets underway in a Seattle courtroom. I quit my job and I went to the trial every single day and it really affected me emotionally and so I told everybody that I'm going to be completely fine once this man is held accountable. We felt like we had a really strong circumstantial case but it also was the kind of case that we could lose. Will the prosecutor's mountain of evidence be enough to convince the jury? She was only a mile from her residence. They bring out a bloodhound, got an item of clothing which belonged to Sione. The dog tracks from the car to the house, the way she was dressed. The shoes, I think, were big. The DNA on that. The duplicates of the things that have been packed. And then there were little things. All of the many lies that Sione Louie told us. He was cheating on her, screwing around on her. And then there is the ring. The ring was the icing on the cake. As for the mysterious speck of blood on the gear shift. It was matched to a mechanic that had worked on her car previously. While the evidence points to Sione as Elena's murderer, what was his motive? Sione killed her because she was going to leave him. He told her friend, I can't live without Elena. He told Christina Bartlett, she was killed by someone who couldn't live without her. On April 24, 2008, the jury deliberates for less than three hours. That's unheard of in a circumstantial case, and it's a bad sign. I was literally holding my breath, literally holding it. Your heart sort of stops, and you never know what's going to happen. And then when they said, guilty, I just screamed. And it was like the biggest rush of relief he finally was going to pay for what he did. He had taken a wonderful mother away from her son and a daughter away from her parents and a sister away from her sisters and a friend away from her friend. Sione Louie is sentenced to 16 years in prison. It was a great day when the jury convicted him. The jury put all the pieces of this puzzle together, and his time was up. There's a huge sense of gratification and satisfaction and happiness that we were able to speak for her. You become her voice. The world now knows what happened to her. He took Elena's freedom away. It's his turn to be locked up and ready. Right.